So good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for having me in this workshop. Uh, I'm Sébastien Crozet, so I've been working with Russ for quite a few years now, um, mainly on mathematical libraries, uh, in particular uh, N-algebra, which is one of the main um, linear algebra libraries in Rust, and Rapier, which is a physics engine um, for Rust. So in this presentation, um, we have two parts. The first part will be about Rapier, so some information on its features, uh, some demos, and um, some basic usage of the library. And a second part, uh, which is a lot more technical, more theoretical, about distributed physics with Rapier, but also with any kind of physics engine you might want to use. So let's talk about Rapier. So Rapier is a 2D and 3D physics engine. Um, by 2D and 3D, I mean that it has two versions, one version for 2D and one version for 3D, but it's, they both rely on the same code, which is interesting because as far as I know, it might be one of the only libraries with this kind of features, which means um, when I have to fix a bug or to improve performances, I only have one code, code base to, to modify. And it's real 2D physics, so with actual 2D vectors, 2D matrices, etc. It's not just a 3D version uh, with some constraints on one of the axes. So you do gain the extra performances by using 2D. So it's a rigid body physics engine. Rigid body means that all the objects are rigid, so they don't sustain any kind of deformations. And this allows for quite a few simplifications on the maths, <clears throat> and we will see some examples afterward. Um, one of the main uh, key features of Rapier is cross-platform determinism. It means that in any device, you can have Rapier run exactly the same way. So this includes my MacBook Pro here, which has an M1 processor. This includes any kind of uh, recent smartphones with ARM processors, or also desktop or laptops with Intel or AMD processors. So <clears throat> it will be cross-platform determinism, so it will work exactly the same on all of these um, platforms, which is very interesting for, for example, uh, networked games. And we will see a very interesting demo later. It has um, AOSOA SIMD optimization, so AOSOA is array of struct of array SIMD, which means we can solve multiple constraints simultaneously and also for um, quite a few operations can be dealt with uh, with four lanes directly. Um, right now, AOSOA SIMD optimizations is um, not compatible with cross-platform determinism, unfortunately. So you have to pick between two, the two. We have JavaScript and TypeScript bindings. So you can use Rapier from JavaScript and, and TypeScript. And it's compiled to WebAssembly. But it's a bit more than just the WebAssembly version. So quite a few physics en engines out there will just expose a very raw API for uh, their JavaScript version, so it's very difficult to use. But in the case of Rapier, we do have automatically generated JavaScript bindings, but also the manually written um, layers for the bindings and to have a very more object-oriented and a much nicer API when you're a JavaScript developer. And we also have a baby plugin. So here we have quite a few logos. Um, Firefox is a game engine written in Rust. It's a very interesting game engine because it is quite feature complete. It uses Rapier as its main uh, physics engine and it has a very, very nice um, game editor if you want to create your game in a more 
WYSIWYG approach, like with Unity, for example. Bevy, so you will probably learn a lot more about, about Bevy uh, for the talk right after mine with Alice. Um, so Rapier has a plugin for Bevy. It's not the official physics engine. Um, there are recently one additional physics engine named Bevy XPBD that you want, might want to check out. It's very interesting too, based on the XPBD approach from NVIDIA. <coughs> Croquet is a platform for creating multiplayer games very easily in JavaScript. And they actually are the main reason why Rapier has JavaScript bindings today and why Rapier has cross-platform determinism because that's something they need in their platform and you will have a chance to learn more about Croquet in Anvo Talk today. Quicker Game, it's a small JavaScript platform to create very simple games in JavaScript. And Ultimax, so Ultimax, it's a VR game using Rapier as a physics engine. It's published on Steam, and it was written by Resolution Games, which is a very well-known company for VR games. So that's some of the examples that I'm aware of for the usage of Rapier. Uh, so let's see um, a few of the basics features of a rigid body physics engine. So <clears throat> when you want to use a rigid body physics engine, the first concept that should come in mind is the concept of rigid body. So rigid body is an object which cannot be um, deformed. So because it cannot be deformed, you can actually think of it as a single point with an orientation. And the rigid body in Rapier is everything you need for dynamics. So it's dynamics in a mechanical sense. So it's like positions, velocity, acceleration, forces, etc. But if you just have a rigid body, you can't really do very cool things. Like you can simulate a ballistic motion like a point in space which will be affected by gravity, but you cannot have stacks of objects that you can hit, which is way funnier. So you want to add a second concept, so the concept of geometry. And this concept is covered by colliders in Rapier. In other physics engine, it might have a different name, like in box 2D, it's called a fixture, for example. And with Rapier, it's called a collider. So the collider combines everything you need about geometry. So it has, well, the geometry itself, like square, triangle, circle, triangle meshes, eight fields, etc. But also things like density, which when you multiply the density by the surface or volume, you obtain the mass contrib contribution of the collider to the rigid body. And collision groups is also a very usual feature in physics engine. It's a way for you to ignore some pairs of collisions in the scene. And colliders will be attached to a rigid body if you want the collider to move in space. And by combining colliders and rigid bodies, that's when you can start having very cool simulations because that's when you will be able to have stacks of objects or objects with an actual volume. But there's one more feature we will find in every rigid body physics engine that's very useful. It's the concept of joints. So a joint is here to attach two rigid bodies with each other, and you can create trees or chains or loops of joints. And it's this tool we can use to make very nice effects like ragdolls. In video games, often we have the players which dies, and when the player dies, it will start behaving like it has actual limbs on the floor, and that's where joints can be used. You can use a joint or a set of joints to create ropes or to create uh, bridges, or you can even use 
a lot of joints to simulate some kind of deformation by using a lot of rigid bodies attached by joints, you will have something that looks like uh, deformable bodies, even if it's actually just rigid. <clears throat> so, with these basic concepts, let's see what it looks like in rapier. So this, this is um, the main repository of Rapier. Um, in this repository, you will find two directories in particular, examples 2D and examples 3D. Um, also examples 3D F64, because Rapier has a 64 um, floating point version. And if we go in example, uh, example 3D, you will see there are quite a few demos. And in particular, you might want to run the all examples free demo, which is what I will do here. So this first demo is, uses a more advanced features, which is called continuous collision detection to avoid um, the fact that very fast object might miss some collisions in its trajectory. In particular, the fast one on the left here doesn't miss any contact. Um, but let's see a much more simple um, demo, so the convex polyhedron. So here it's a very simple demo. You have um, a bunch of convex shapes falling under gravity. Quite trivial. So in the code, this looks like this. So because all these demos share the same code base for the main simulation loop, all here will only contain the initialization of the scene. So you will see a rigid body set and a collider set, which obviously are where you will insert your rigid bodies and colliders. We also have impulse joint set and multi-body joint set, but we won't be using them in this demo because we don't have any joint, but they are needed to initialize the scene. That's why they are not mutable because we won't change them. So when we want to initialize the ground, we have to first create a rigid body. Um, we are using a builder pattern to make this uh, nicer. It's a fixed rigid body, so it doesn't move. It has some initial position. We insert the rigid body into the rigid body set and we get an handle, so handles are very uh, usual in Rust because it's a, a, more, a safer way to address your um, components without having to deal with some kind of pointer issues. We create a cuboid, so it's not called a box because in Rust box is a reserve name. Um, so we create this cuboid for the floor and we insert the cuboid in the collider set with the handle of the parent rigid body, which means our floor will have a fixed rigid body and a cuboid, cuboid shape attached to it. And if we look at the convex polyhedra, it's actually quite the same code. So we are creating this time a dynamic rigid body, which means it can move. We insert the rigid body to the rigid body set. We create a round convex hull shape. Um, so a round convex hull is a convex polyhedron with round edges, which can, it's in, in general, it's uh, a bit more efficient to use round convex hull than just convex hull with sharp edges for some mathematical reasons. And we insert these colliders uh, attached to the rigid body parent. So that's this demo. Um, let's see an example of joints. So we have the impulse joints example here. So it shows quite a few kinds of joints in Rapier. Um, so in Rapier, all the joints are actually implemented as one generic six degrees of freedom or three degrees of freedom joint in 3D or 2D. And so all the joints are mainly nice interfaces um, on this generic joint type. Um, so if we start the simulation, here we have quite a few types of joints. We have on the bottom here uh, a lot of um, ball joints. So a ball joint is a, a, a joint which allows all 
the rotations between two objects. We have here a lot of revolute joints, and we actually have joint motors, so a motor is a way to inject kinetic energy in your system, uh, which is how, for example, to simulate a car, you will create motion uh, for the wheels. On the right here, you have prismatic joints. Prismatic joints are joints for one translational translation movement, and in this case, they are affected by the motors to make the, the, the cubes move uh, against gravity. If I restart the simulation, and you can see here that it's quite wobbly, um, which is something you, we don't really want from a physics engine, but we, we talk about this later. Um, here we also have some revolute joint, but this time we have limits, joint limits constraints, which means they don't keep rotating indefinitely. They, they will stop at some angle. So the two boxes here will stop falling at some point. And this one is interesting because they actually are fixed joint. And a fixed joint is supposed to keep the two objects uh, tightly attached with each other without any kind of movement. So in theory, it should just look like this flat plane during the whole simulation. But we can see here that it's also quite wobbly. So one very common issue um, users will have with joints is this kind of wobbliness. It's because a physics engine or at least a game physics engine, will usually have some kind of iterative force computation for everything, for contacts, for joints. And because it's iterative, it will not always converge to the actual forces they have to create in order to really make the joint constraint correct. <clears throat> so we will have some violations of the constraint. And in, in this case, we have forces that are too low in order to keep the plane completely flat. And in this case, we have an oscillation between high forces and low forces, mainly because we have these motors which keeps adding energy to the system. And <clears throat> actually, these two joints, uh, prismatic joints and fixed joints, are kind of the the most difficult ones to simulate without errors. So what can you do to fix this? Well, because it's an iterative approach, the first thing you can try is to increase the number of iterations for the constraint solver. So the constraint solver computes forces. So with more iterations, it will get closer to the actual uh, reali realistic value for the forces. So let's do this. Here with Rapier, we have a quite low number of iterations at first because it's more focused on performances. But let's say we go crazy and we use a very large number here. So with this large number of iterations, we can see that the simulation looks much better. The flat plane here remains flat, except at the beginning we do have a little bit bit of wobbliness, and on the right, the prismatic joints look perfect, and the rest also look quite good. So the problem with having a lot of iterations will be performances. With 200 iterations, which is way more than we typically need in a, an actual game, we are running with five milliseconds of runtime, where compared with um, the initial configurations, which was four and one, so about 50 times less iterations, we are running in less than one millisecond. So we have, uh, as a game programmer, we have to make a compromise between efficiency and accuracy. There's a second way to improve this situation, and this way is substepping. So substepping is that instead of running one physics step to 
for each frame of your game, for example. You will run multiple physics steps simulating a shorter amount of time in the physics world. So here we have a stepping uh, parameter set to 60 Hz, which means every physics step will simulate 16 milliseconds on the physics world. If we reduce, or if we increase this frequency to reduce this uh, simulated time, uh, maybe by increasing to 240, which means we divide by four the amount of physics time simulated, we can see here that the simulation actually looks way better, even if we keep these four iterations and one iteration. So well, that's another way to improve the stability of your simulation by adding more steps. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing too is that each step here will still only cost you half a millisecond. So if you multiply this by four, because now instead of running the physics engine once per frame, you will have to run it four times you still have uh, two milliseconds of computation times, which is still quite much lower than when we had to switch to 200 iterations. So that's an interesting approach. It will also improve the quality of collision detection. Uh, you might have less tuning, so you might not need co uh, continuous collision detection. So it's a nice tool. But we also have a third tool to improve the behavior of joints, which is to completely change the way joints are modeled mathematically. So right now, we are at every frame of the simulation, we are computing forces for each joint. So the forces will try to keep the object together so that um, the joint constraints are not violated. But Instead of relying on forces, we could encode directly the joint constraint as part of the, of the equations of motions of the system, which means that, for example, for this one, which is a revolute joint, which allows only one rotation between the two objects, in, instead of using 12 variables, so three translations and three rotations for one object and free translation and free rotations for the obje other objects, we could use just one variable in our equation of motion, which is just the angle between the two objects. So that way, we encode directly the constraints in the equations. And Rapier has this concept. So in, in, in mathematics, it's called a reduced coordinates approach to models of joints. And in Rapier, it's called a multi-body joint. And if I switch to this demo, so this also resets all the settings here, we can see that with the multi-body joints, everything looks completely perfect. We have a perfectly flat plane here. We have um, prismatic joints behaving without any kind of wobbliness. And that's actually normal because the constraint is part of the equations of motion. So that is mathematically no way that your joint can be violated. So that's actually quite nice. But we can't really use this every time. It does have some limitations. Because of the way the math works, we ca you cannot simulate um, a necklace, for example. You can simulate a, a loop of joints. And um, it also can be quite um, expensive in terms of computation times. For example, here, for this scene where everything are um, multi-body joints, the computation time is close to four milliseconds, so kind of close to when we had 200 iterations. But this is an approach um, very common in robotics more than in games. Usually for video games, uh, people will use impulse joints with maybe a higher number of iterations, but it's still a very good approach if you really want perfect joints uh, somewhere in your game. And you can mix the two in the same simulation. You can have some impulse joint and some multi-body joint. You can even have simulate a necklace where everything is a multi-body joint and just one of them is an impulse joint so that you don't have an actual loop 
with your multi-body joints. Okay, so this um, demo application has quite a few of our demo, and I won't go through all of them. <coughs> uh, in the benchmark, 2D and benchmarks 3D, you also have some um, more bigger scenes where you can compare performances with other physics engine, well, just physics currently. So yeah, this is, um, this is the base version of Rapier. So if, it's, if you don't use it with Bevy or with JavaScript. Rapier has um, a set of user guides for the three approaches. So the basic version here, the Bevy plugin, the JavaScript version. And um, all, we, all three versions we try to get closer to what people are used when using Bevy or when using JavaScript. And if we see here in the Rapier um, website, here, rapier.rs, if you look at this demo here, this is using the JavaScript bindings for Rapier. And here we can switch to a different demo, and let's take the same as before, which is a convex polyhedron. This time it's um, <coughs> falling on the, a triangle mesh. So we can try something interesting here. So let's say I stop the simulation, restart, and run for a few steps. Stop the simulation. So first we have a debug renderer um, that you might be interested in. So it's a way for you to be sure that objects in your simulation are actually where you think they are. It's not an actual renderer. It just tells you exactly which lines you have to render, but you can use any render you want, except for the Bevy plugin, where we have a plugin for the, this renderer. And um, so here I stop the simulation. I have this debug info button. I can click it and make one last step. Oh, maybe we, have, we are step 199, and let's, let's just one more, 200. It looks better. Um, <clears throat> so here we are at step 200, and what happens here is that at every step when we have this debug info uh, checked, we will serialize the state of the complete physics engine. And we compute a checksum of this, of this state, so of the bytes for this state. And this checksum is here. And the thing is, the JavaScript version is always compiled with cross-platform determinism enabled. We, we could publish um, a non-deterministic uh, version, and it would actually be a bit faster. Quick test is about between 10 to 15 percent faster, but haven't done it yet. <clears throat> so right now it's always uh, cross-platform deterministic, and if you go to the Rapier website, uh, to this exact same demo here, and if you make sure that you have the same version of Rapier here, and if you run this simulation until step 200, you will see the exact same number here even if you try it on your phone, on any kind of uh, recent computer. And that's how deterministic this is. Every single bit in the physics state is the same on all the platforms. All right. So <clears throat> now this is um, the general architecture of Rapier. Uh, it's, it's quite um, tradi traditional in its, way, its architecture in that we have uh, collision detection, we have force calculation, so um, yeah, force calculation with P PJS is projected ghost saddle, uh, integration and collision detection. So we, we have two collision detection steps because the first one is more about um, collision detection between objects um, which were moved by the user between two steps. And the main collision detection part is at the end here. And we might have a loop here for continuous collision detection by slicing time into smaller chunks based on how fast objects move. Um, aside from this main physical simulation pipeline, we have a query pipeline which is responsible for all the scene queries, so ray casting, shape casting, etc. 
And we have a character controller and vehicle controller, which are here for you to create a character or a vehicle in the game. Um, and it's based on a kinematic body, rigid body, which means it's a rigid body you have a total control on, um, completely ignoring any kind of physics rule, uh, which is usually what you want in, in a game because you don't want your player to be affected by very realistic um, physics. And these controllers are based on ray casting here and shape casting to make sure they don't go through uh, any kind of obstacle. All right, if you want to take a look at the user guides, we have the links here. It's just the same thing as uh, I was showing before here. Okay, <clears throat> so that was Rapier. It's, it has a lot more features than uh, what I showed. Uh, it also has cohesion group, continuous cohesion detection, uh, all sorts of different shapes. Etc. So you can explore all everything uh, in the user guide. Now let's talk about distributed physics. So distributed physics here, uh, I, I will I won't cover uh, the complete topic. I will cover only one um, typical problem you might face when working on distributed physics and with a proposal for a solution. And again, it, this applies to any kind of physics engine. I'm obviously. Uh, testing this with Rapier, but you can use anything you want. It doesn't even depend on the cross-platform deterministism uh, feature. Maybe it could to improve it further, but I don't know. So why would you want to do distributed physics? Well, the main idea is to have multiple Rapier instances contributing to the same physics world. And these instances may run on multiple machines. And the goal here is to simulate as many objects as we want to scale infinitely for a very, very, very large open world game or very, very large metaverse. And I want to distinguish between two use cases. The first one is to simulate a very large number of objects um, but they are not all interacting with each other. Here we have a lot of uh, individual stacks of objects. And um, yeah, we do see some gaps between the objects here. So that's a typical thing you will find in video games, which is um, objects which are not part of the same huge pile. In video games, when you move through the world, you will sometimes observe some physics interactions, interactions with your environment, but we, just don't, we won't have one huge stack. And on the other hand, we might want to simulate a lot of objects in a very huge pile of objects. And this one is more interesting for animation of scientific computing when you want to focus on one very uh, small objects or one behavior in your scene and you want to simulate this very accurately. So in our case, we won't try to solve this problem. We won't try, for example, to segment this system into multiple parts and have the system simulated by multiple machines because that would be very difficult because you have to involve a lot of communication uh, within your constraints resolution loop. Because here, force computation is a global problem. The force applied to this cube on the top is actually dependent on the force applied to this cube on the bottom. So it's really a global problem. Here we can already see some inde independent chunks of works because each pile here are independent from a force calculation point of view. So we will mainly focus on this one. So the general idea here is um, to apply some spatial subdivision. And we are using a grid-based subdivision. So we have this um, regular grid. It's very an implicit regular grid. And also a sparse grid because we won't represent every single cell because our world 
is supposed to be infinite. And we will say that every physics, in physics instance will simulate one cell of this grid. So here we have uh, 24, 28 cells, if we don't count the cells outside of the screen. And the first instance will simulate this cell, this cell will be simulated by a different instance, etc. Which means that the first instance here will simulate all these small stacks, and all the other instances will have no idea that these stacks exist. So in this case, it's quite easy. We could run this simulation, and it would work directly, because all the objects are quite nicely aligned. But we could have something like this. So here we have four regions, so we zoomed into four cells in our grid, and we have two objects, a blue one and orange one. So based on what I just said, the blue one would be simulated by C and the orange one would be simulated by D. And D would have no idea that the blue object exists, and vice versa. And now we have a third object, which is the green rectangle here. And now we have a problem, because the green one intersects all the regions in the scene. So the question is, which instance of your physics simulation should simulate the green object? You could think that uh, A should simulate it, because I don't know if it crosses A. But A only sees the green object, doesn't see the blue and the orange one, because they are handled by different Rapier instance. They may even be on a different computer. So A will see the green object and apply gravity. And because we don't have the blue and orange objects, it will just fall down, which is incorrect. And the same applies to B. For C, it's slightly different because C knows about the blue box. So it will create a rotation here because of the contact point between the two objects, which is also incorrect. And for D, it's the same thing, but rotating on the other side. So any choice here is actually incorrect. And we could actually try to simulate the green object with all the regions and try to merge the motion information. But that sounds quite complex and not valid from a mathematical point of view. So we will do something different. We will work with a concept of island. So in physics engines, the concept of island is quite common. It is a way to group objects into groups that interact with each other. So here we have three islands. The green one is just one object. The blue one is four objects we are touching each other. So the green and blue are not part of the same island because they are disjoint here. And even if we had a floor below them, it wouldn't merge the two islands because a static object does not transmit any force. Same thing with the red object. And we will define a total ordering um, between our cells. So in grid coordinates, we could use Cartesian, Cartesian coordinates. We would have 0, 0 cell, 1, 0, etc. And if we focus on the gray cell, so the 0, 0 cell, everything that's green is considered greater based on this ordering system. And everything that orange is considered lower based on this ordering system. So we will take one step further to simplify our problem, which is to use bounded boxes. So each island here is um, simplified as one single box, which encloses everything. So we don't have to deal with every single geometry, which may be quite difficult if you have complex geometries like triangle meshes or eight fields. So we have boxes for islands and we have ordering for regions. Now, if we have our islands in the physical space, we will have maybe something like this. One island can cover multiple regions. And um, we will say that an island is entirely simulated by one a single region to keep the mathematical correctness. And this region will be the greatest among all the regions intersected by the island. So for the green one, it will be simulated by minus one, minus one, because it's only intersecting minus one, minus one. The blue one is, is intersecting two cells. 
and the greatest cells is one minus one here, so it will be completely um, simulated by one minus one, and the orange cell here will completely ignore existence of this island. And the same thing for the red uh, islands will be simulated only by one one. So this is, if you consider a static picture of your scene, you will subdivide your workload this way, based on which island is intersecting which region, and which region intersected is the greatest. So you get something like this. Here we have one color per region, and you can see that, that each group of objects has the same color. So we don't have here, we, we are at the limit between red and blue, and we don't have something that's half red and half blue. So the complete island is simulated by the same physics sensor, so we don't have any problems in terms of force computation. Now, because we don't have just a static scene, we have some movements. So we have to deal transition from one, one region to another. So for example here, if this blue object moves, it will have to be moved from zero, zero to one, one, because it started intersecting the greatest greater uh, region one, one. And here we have a more complicated approach, a complicated configuration where the blue object will start interacting with one object which is managed by one, one. And this is complex because zero, zero has no idea this black box exists. So we define a watch set, which is a set of bounding box that exists only at the geometric level so we can detect this case here. So we, we can discuss more about this case uh, after the talk if you're interested, but don't have a lot of time left. <clears throat> so by taking into account this system, we can, oh yeah, and this is a case if we intersect this one, which is a task to one zero. So we can start move this scene here and we can see how the island um, change from one region to another as the complete scene rotates. And again, when it changes color, so when it switch from one region to another, it completely changes. All, every single box in the complete island will change. So this is uh, an idea of the implemented infrastructure. We have a set of clients, so to visualize the scene, the partitioner, which is responsible for managing all uh, the um, instances that will run the simulations, and the runners, which are just a program running the simulation in a loop. What happens is that when the client starts a simulation, it will ask the partitioner to insert the object. The partitioner will, based on the, the object's geometry and position, it will initialize a few runners, creating a mesh of runner and to handle transition from one region to another, we will have communication directly between the runners. And this communication is based on Zeno, which we also use for other purposes like time synchronization. And we have our black boxes for the watch sets, which are <coughs> inserted into Redis. And when an object moves from one runner to some non-existing region, it will ask the partitioner to create this region with an associated runner, which will fill the mesh so we never have an object not simulated by anything. Okay, and we are, last we have the positions which are also stored uh, in Redis so we can read them from the client, but this is not very optimized, this part, uh, this, this part is not very optimized, I haven't really focused on this yet. All right, so we do have a few more steps to improve distributed physics. We have to think about the allocations of resources, like when a runner doesn't have any um, more work, if it doesn't have any objects in it, or if uh, all the objects are just staying immobile. Um, we want to stop a runner. We have send queries, shape casting, ray casting, um, inside of the scene, so how do we make raycasts cross regions and user interaction and collaboration. So well, here you have a few links uh, for Rapier, the Rapier website, the Rapier repository for the base library, 
uh, the JavaScript bindings and the Bevy plugin. And Stadium is just uh, a test bed I use for testing um, the distributed physics. So it's something very simple. You can draw some object here. You can move objects here. You can start the simulation and you can grab some objects. You can look at some of the properties of the objects. Yeah, it's a very basic uh, physics sandbox. Uh, some of the buttons don't do anything, like uh, previous um, undo and redo don't do anything right now. And you can import a mesh, you have some. The built-in center are just the things I use for to test the distributed physics. Uh, so if you want to try it, it has a readme. You can, you can try it as a standalone mode and distributed mode. Okay, so that's it for physics. Thank you very much for being here.